Um, my name's Carrie. I am um, an oncology social worker. So I've worked on the floors in um, the cancer ward, mostly at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne for um, the last 23 years. Um, and I also work at UTAS in Tasmania, where I live now, um, in the Centre for Rural Health. So I grew up in Tassie and have a heart for um, the health system that looks very different in the city areas where I've worked a lot and where I grew up. And um, yeah, we've got so far to go in Tassie. It's astounding to me that we're still back there. Um, so I still live in Launceston, but I still work at St Vincent's um, Hospital, but not doing so much of the clinical work anymore, um, which I miss greatly. And um, what I'm wanting to speak to you about today is, I guess what we've picked up over the years about how we understand um, what the experience is like to be diagnosed with breast cancer and what we have found works. Now, I've never had breast cancer. I've sat with hundreds of people that have, but I'm certainly not the expert in lived experience. So what I'm wanting you to do is to go, yeah, nothing like my experience or yes, that resonates with me and it's useful to see it in that kind of framework. Um, and also for us to share what's, what has worked for you um, and what hasn't. So I'm just gonna leap in. Um, okay, so um, I start with this quote. You never know how strong you are until being strong is your only choice. Um, and I just think this is a really important statement because you know, you get a lot of, gosh, you're so amazing that you've coped so well and that you're, you know, you're here today and you attended this event or that event. And the reality is, is that you did not have a choice. You had no choice but to face something that was pretty scary and just keep going. And so I just want to start by acknowledging that because I do think you're all amazing and I think that the human spirit just never fails to surprise me. Um, and I've been around people that have had really big stuff to cope with. Um, but the, the first thing just to say is you don't really have much choice, do you? And you've um, hopefully have all amazed yourselves as well, but um, I just wanna kind of start with that. I think the experience of getting a diagnosis like cancer and some of you will have had other major things in your life that this will fit with too, is like crossing a bridge. So I often use this as, as an analogy and this painting is of a blind woman crossing a bridge. So I say that because you're going along with your life and you have plans and you know who your friends are and you know what you have control of and then a diagnosis happens and you are everything is turned upside down and you're made to cross over this bridge so you go from being someone who is well and then someone who must have has breast cancer, even if you're feeling okay. And the crossing of the bridge is a really uncomfortable place to be because now you have to reassess a whole lot of things um, and you're not really sure what's on the other end of the bridge. So often when I had people um, referred to me, it was when they were in that middle bit of none of us like um, uncertainty. It's horrible to kind of sit with. Um, and so crossing that bridge, um, which happens with any major change in our life, takes a, an adjustment process. And sometimes we people talk about a journey, but actually I think one of the things that's very clear is that the process of that bridge is not a straight line. Um, and this is a picture of... Um, a road that's called, it's called Jacob's Ladder and it's just outside of Launceston and it's the road up to our closest ski field. Um, and I think it's interesting when I think about my different ages of my dealings with Jacob's Ladder. So Jacob's Ladder is, it's a one lane road. So I just want you to think about icy road, right? So you go up this road and if someone's coming in the other direction, you have to reverse back to one of the corner bits and let them pass. So I remember doing this with like, you know, when I was in my teens and a couple of us finally got their license. I went up on the back of a ute once 
And the guy that was driving thought it'd be really funny to like, you know, it was swerving up there and we went up really fast and we all thought it was hilarious. And then I've been up there, you know, in the car and it's kind of like, yeah, I don't really, really like this, it's scary. I don't go up there anymore. Like it just, it's, now it's just, I'm at that point where things just get too scary. So, but it, it is like this, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> yep, I've just adjusted with this and I'm going, okay, oh, here's another thing to deal with and I'm just going to go with that. So, yes, I think that's probably more like it. I want to tell you about a study that we did at St Vincent's in 2002 and I think this still stands. Um, so I um, had been the social worker in the oncology unit for a little while and I noticed that I kept getting referred um, women who'd finished treatment for early stage breast cancer. So I knew, I knew everyone when they were first diagnosed. And then you kind of monitor amazing day oncology nurses would look after people and people would come in and they'd go through treatment and they'd do really well and everyone would be, wow, an amazing person. And then when they came for their first post-treatment um, medical appointment, which was I think at that stage about six weeks after treatment finished, um, the doctor would call me and say, Carrie, I think you need to see this person. Like, they won't stop crying and they seem really upset. And they, she did so well during treatment. I don't know why now it's impacting. So we decided to do one of our first studies where we just asked <laughs> women to tell us what the experience was like. We also asked partners to tell us what it was like. And I just want to tell you what they told me because... And these are the original slides because it hasn't changed, I don't think. OK, so what they said to us was that... So we'd go back to that bridge idea. They went from being a well person, whatever you want to, terminology feels okay with you, but they went from being their normal self to suddenly being a cancer patient. They're in an oncologist's room and they're talking about chemotherapy and it's like my brain hasn't even caught up with this. And the experience that they described was that they were in shock and we absolutely know that is it's right when we're asking people to make big decisions, you are in shock. That's the really cool thing that our bodies do to brace ourselves when something big has been handed to us. Really understandable thing. Not a great time to make decisions, but you have to. And this real bewilderment. And the adjustment task that they said they had to go through was that to manage that shock and keep going and make treatment-related decisions. And so the coping strategy, if you like, is that they were appraising, OK, how bad is this? Um, and it might be at that point that you're going, you know what, this is terrible, but I'm going to be all right and I'm going to go through treatment and I'm, they're telling me it's all going to be fine. But you're going, so you're doing all this adjustment. So I'll give you a couple of quotes. Um, one woman said, it was one of those moments that will live on in life. It's scary. I hope I never have that moment again when she tells me it's cancer. And another one said she described it like a photographic still with crying, the feeling of tears. Mum was at the end of the bed. She burst out crying and ran. Now, um, we, I think KP said this morning, mentioned the, the concept of trauma. And my job at the moment at St Vincent's is that we are looking at the whole way we provide services at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne under a trauma-informed care framework, um, which is kind of a bit of a wanky way of saying we need to actually understand what the experience of like for everyone who comes through the door and all the stuff we don't actually see because it's a silent thing with trauma. <clears throat> Let me explain what I mean by that. Because when this quote of it feels like I'm watching myself in a movie, so that photographic still is a really common experience that people say had this massive thing just told to me and it's like I'm not even in the room, I'm just looking at myself going through that motion. So let me tell you about trauma. Um, and I'm going to give you a personal example um, of really how incredible our minds are to when we are faced with difficult things. Um, but we need to understand this process so that we can work back from it. Okay, so trauma is an adverse event that happens that overwhelms our ability to cope. So up until recently, we kind of saw trauma as, I know someone's been in a massive car accident and they've been brought, they've got multiple injuries, they come into the hospital, we all go, this is a trauma patient. 
and we need to do all sorts of gentle things and be careful and understand they're going to be really um, thrown by this experience. That is true. That's what's called big T trauma. What we know is that there's also what we call little t trauma and it's not less than, it's just that they are smaller things that happen to us regularly in our lives. Um, and they are any event that overwhelms us. So if you think of an experience as a child, um, say you're in a classroom and the teacher yells at you and they yell at you for something you didn't even do, they didn't realise, you have this feeling inside you so you might sit there, take it, go through the motions of the day, don't let anyone else know it upset you, but you will never forget that feeling. You might be in a hospital, in a doctor's room, and they say, I'm sorry, it's breast cancer, and the same thing. Something happens inside us, and um, it overwhelms our ability to cope in that moment. So I'll give you a personal example. Um, I, um, te nearly 10 years ago, in a couple of weeks' time, it'll be 10 years, I was on a tram on my way to work at St Vincent's, busy tram, lots of people on it, it's in the morning, and my niece rang me screaming to say that my sister had died in her sleep overnight. My sister was 50, she was a single mother of six kids, she was in Tassie. And so I'm on the tram um, and I get this news that is horrific and I remember almost feeling oh my God, this is too big, and then going, okay, I'm on a tram, I need to make sure I get a message to my mum, I'm going to have to get to work and get someone else to do that thing tomorrow and I'm going to have to organise a plane and get home. So I remember going through that, I was had an overwhelmingly stressful thing told to me and then I clicked. Um, now, I will be careful saying this, but anyway, we know that, that children that were abused... Um, when they were little, they will tell you the same thing. They learnt how to leave the room in that moment because it was too big. But we do that constantly. So let me describe that. Your mind becomes flooded with emotion and we often unconsciously stop feeling almost part way through. So we hear the news and then we go, no, can't do that right now, thank you. We go into shock. And it does feel like you're watching yourself in a movie. And it's a really clever thing to do. It's very helpful. It helps us get through things. And usually what then happens... So I knew in that moment what was happening to me. I knew I had to do a whole lot of things. I knew that my time would come that I would need to grieve my sister. Um, the problem can be when we don't go back to it. And so we've, we've frozen that thing inside... And now we're fine until we're on a tram and we hear, I don't know, the same music being played and suddenly we become overwhelmed. We go, God, what was that from? And it was because that thing happened. So I've used the word trauma when describing the experience of having breast cancer and treatment or any cancer and treatment for a very long time and people have gone, well, really, is it traumatic? Yeah, it is because it's those many little moments um, and I, no one can guess what your moments, what your hard moments have been. Because it's always different and usually we don't see it. But I really want to acknowledge it because it's both really clever, that's part of how you've coped, and it's important that we understand that this is the reason why we need to make sure you have trustworthy people around you, you get the right information, you are involved in your care, you have choices, you are empowered because of the traumatic experience that it can be. Okay, so right back then they were already, these women were telling us, it, that moment of hearing it and it all heading to me, I felt it and then I had to just get on with treatment. So um, there's a really clever guy who's written a lot about this stuff, his name's Gabor Maté and he says trauma is not what happens to you, it is what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. And that's a really important thing to think, to remember. Okay, so then the women in that study... There you go. Did you want to take a photo? <laughs> then the women in that study talked about going through treatment. Now, this was um, a very long time ago, so um, maybe the treatment experiences aren't quite as bad, but I'm not going to say that because everyone has different experience. So... 
Um, the experience that was described at the time was, I've just got to get through this. And someone really helpfully used the analogy of, a ra you know, our racehorses have these blinkers. Um, and so the women in this study were saying, I was aware that my mum cried every time I walked in the room. I was aware that the kids were worried or that we weren't sure what was going to happen with, with work and money. I was aware of all this stuff, but I couldn't take it in because I just had to get through treatment. I went like this. Just got to get through treatment, just got to get through treatment. Totally understandable. Another really clever coping mechanism. Um, but while I'm doing that, I've got to manage this psychological and physical trauma. But I'm just managing, so I've got to get going, get through it. The adjustment task was about managing this reality. Suddenly I'm maybe not at work or I'm not at work as much. People are dropping off meals. The phone won't stop ringing. In those days, of course, people had answering machines. And so my thing was get the answering machine, give an update on the answering machine, let everyone ring it. Now we can do other things. Um, but I've got to manage all this stuff that's going on. I've got to manage the fact that I don't know what's going to happen at the end of treatment. I've got to adjust and I've got to cope with the fact that I know all these people around me that love me are really hurting and I can't fix it. So I'm just going to do that and keep going. So the coping strategy during this phase was avoidance and not thinking about what possibly could happen. Um, dealing with the fact that lots of people kept telling me I had to think positively even though I was screaming inside. Focusing on all the tasks and the social supports. Totally useful, but gave us a clue as to what was going to happen when treatment finished. So I'll give you a quote. Um, one woman said, it was just awful. It was as bad or worse than I ever expected it to be. Every time you have a dose of chemotherapy, it takes your body longer uh, to get better. I just couldn't really see it ending. And another one said, during treatment, you're in go forward mode. Really important words, sorry. Um, I didn't stop to think about what was really happening to me. So I've absolutely had women say, I didn't even really think, I, I didn't really take in that I had cancer. I went through the motions during that time, but it didn't really, I didn't really kind of take that. Totally understandable. Um, because you are dealing with what's in front of you. And then, in this, at this particular time, treatment finished and... Suddenly, the first question is like, am I still a cancer patient? Am I a cancer survivor? Am I someone who had cancer? How do I describe myself to a new person I meet? That whole kind of who am I now that treatment's finished. There was absolutely relief that I don't have to keep going and having this treatment, but lots of ambivalence and fear. Like, what's going to happen now? And what's going to happen because I'm not seeing the day oncology nurses every whatever, or I'm not doing that stuff. No one's surveilling me very as much. Um, and that is when they were beginning to process the experience. So in this particular scenario, if we go back 2021, it was at that point that they were coming and seeing the doctor and crying and going, oh God, I don't know what this means. I'm looking back and going, I could have died. This is, God, it's cancer. It was only hitting them then because they were far enough away from that initial shocking thing that they could start to think about it. it made total sense that that was when that adjustment process would start. Um, so that time was about adjusting to all these changes, like, you know, what do, we, what do I believe in now? Who are my friends now? What do I want to do with my life now? Treatment's finished. I've had this big thing happen. So there was a process of looking back and starting to look ahead and not quite sure what any of that kind of meant. So Claire said, when she treatment finished, she said, I can do cartwheels down the street. Annie said, whereas at the time of going through treatment, the time of being operated on and having all of that, it was a time when I didn't really think I ever really had cancer. It's a totally understandable, even though that sounds nonsensical, because that's how we cope. Um, looking back, I think it was a bit unreal, whereas now it's becoming real. So one of the really difficult things, and in fact, if you read an account of someone who has been through a trauma, someone who got lost in the desert and they wrote a book about what that was like, they will tell you exactly the same process. And that is that when you're in the middle of it, 
you can't process it. You are just managing it. When it finishes, you go, oh, my God, what does that all mean? What does that mean now? All that stuff that happens. Totally understandable. And, of course, that bridge that we talk about, um, what is really difficult is living with the uncertainty of what's... I don't know what's at the end of this bridge, but I've got... Apparently, I have to just get on with my life now not knowing. So, of course, oh, fear of recurrence is um, massive. It is totally understandable after you've been through that experience. You cannot have your life thrown up in the air and then be told, now just get on with it and be OK when you're not sure about uncertainty. So if you are having fear of recurrence and you start, you're worrying about a sore shoulder or you're worrying, totally understandable. So one of the things you need to say to yourself, you know, gosh, I'm really, it keeps coming up in my mind, that's understandable. This is going to, it will settle. Um, I need to just not have people around me that goes, great, you finished treatments, everything's fine now. <laughs> We're going to get back into life. The family's going to be all be happy again now. That that's when we start feeling like, oh God, I'm not coping. You know, what you're doing is you are at the point where you are adjusting. Um, having survived cancer can make you hyper vigilant, especially if you had no clue that anything was wrong, and then suddenly they told you you had cancer. You're like, well, I don't know how to read my body now. Um, so being hyper vigilant is really understandable. It will settle. For most people, that just settles because after a while you go, yeah, I, every now and then I get a pain here and it's fine and it's not cancer. Um, and so we know that it will greatly diminish in time, but I am going to give you some tips in a sec. We know that there is a real impact on all the other things in your life. And one of the ways I like to talk about the impact on families, and I still feel very strongly that we don't enough say what do you need and what does your family need, is um, by using a picture of one of these mobiles, which is also a bit like it's how social workers write down your family. Like we do what's called a genogram. We go, this is the person and they're married to this or they used to be with this person, this is their kids, and, you know. So we draw it a bit like this. But... With these mobiles, these mobiles hold themselves, okay? They balance each other. And that's what families do. And one of the things we know about families is it's families are really strong in needing equilibrium. They don't cope with change very well. So if you suddenly have someone in the family that goes, actually, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. I'm going to be a acrobat. Families don't cope with stuff like that very well. Needs to adjust. Okay, so if we look at this family here, um, and I'm hoping you all see it as blue. I realise now that we don't always see the colours, but there's a piece there that I would call blue. Say that's the person that's just got a cancer diagnosis. If I went up and I flicked that piece, okay, you've got cancer. Hello, I'm going to flick you. What's going to happen is that everything else in that mobile is going to move. Some bits might twirl up together and get caught up. Some of them might just move a little bit but not, and just go back to where they were. Um, some might just go all over the place. That's what happens to a family when cancer comes through the front door. Um, and I use the term family very loosely here. I'm talking about your tribe of people that are important to you. Um, and that's it's very full on for the person who's living with it because um, everyone responds very differently in the family. Some want to know everything, some want to not know anything, some get really angry, some blame you, like all of that stuff happens. But it's an additional burden um, <coughs> that we need to be much more aware of. In that study where we also asked partners, excuse me, <coughs> the partners talked about going through the same phases but certainly at the point where... Um, the person finished treatment. They were like, great, we're, we're finished. We can get on with things now. And so this, is, this was the point where we often had partners and had couples come in. <coughs> and one was like, God, we've been through all of this. I don't know why she's crying now. Partners go through a very different experience. They have different information needs, the ones that, st that stay. And we know there's some really great ones that it really does affect their life in the same way in a different way but the same pro amount. Um, 
we really need to be supporting partners better to know how to be a partner to someone who's going through a breast cancer experience. We still don't do that well enough. Um, but at some point there needs to be a sharing. This is what it was like for me. This is what it's like for you. Now let's come back together again in what the next thing. We know there is an impact on children. And what we know about little people is that they are built cognitively to be the centre of the universe, of their universe. Um, it's not just because they're selfish. It's how they view the world. And so if we don't tell them what's going on or we give them just a little bit of information or we all stop talking when they come in the room but they, they know something's going on, they will fill in the gaps and it will almost certainly be about them. Something bad happened, mum's crying a lot, grandma just keeps walking out of the room when I come home but no one's telling me so it, like I, it's either I've done something wrong or there must be some reason why they're not telling me. So we know kids need to be involved, they need age appropriate information um, and then they need to keep being kids and they need the door open so they can come back and ask. So they'll hear the, the information, they might be worried and sad and ask some questions and, and let's face it, they'll ask really straight questions. Does this mean you're going to die? My friend's mother had a different cancer and died. Does that mean that's, you know, they ask the stuff that everyone goes, oh my God. But yep, we've got to just answer. This is what we know. This is, where we're, this is what the plan is at the moment. Come back and ask us if something else comes up and then they might go, does it mean I won't be able to play footy anymore? and we need to go, we really need to make sure kids get to keep doing what they need to do in their lives, even if other people have to take them. But we just, we just need to involve them. They can cope um, very well. We mentioned a little bit this morning about um, the disappearing friend mystery. Um, and even though we heard of someone who has had all their friends have been here, and that's fantastic, it's almost universal that people will have someone they assumed would have been there if something bad happened who wasn't. And there's a whole lot of reasons for it, but I just want to say it hurts like hell and it's part of the grief and it's horrible and, it, and it's almost universal, so it's not you. It's not because you weren't enough for that person to be there when you went through a hard time, but it's very common. Equally as common is that people come out of the woodwork that you had no idea. That neighbour you didn't even really acknowledge very much. It's taken my washing every week and just is there. Both those things happen. This is another part of the stress. And so, of course, we embrace those around us that have been able to be there. But I just really want to acknowledge that those losses are, are big and real. And, of course... <sighs> The big impact on, I just want to go back to that point in my life where I wasn't worried about what was going to happen. Um, that carefree, you might have had a whole lot of other things going on in your life before you got this diagnosis, but gee, it would be nice to go back and not know that this has happened. And so that's part of the, the grief as well. So let me talk a bit about what we know can help. So... Anxiety is a really, really common experience. Some of you might have had anxieties um, in your life before this experience. Some of you, it might be the first time you've had, um, you've lived with anxiety, but it's such a common experience. And one of the reasons is that anxiety is about having uncertainty and not being, having any power to fix it. Most experiences of anxiety are about that. Um, and so it's totally understandable that it is such a common experience, even if it's just there are just moments where you feel, gosh, I'm actually a bit panicked about this, or I'm going out to catch up with friends and I'm actually, you know, I'm not just banging out the door. I'm wondering how I'm going to go with this. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is take some of the power back because that helps with the uncertainty. So the first thing is that it's really important to acknowledge that you are a normal, healthy person going through an extraordinary experience and the most understandable thing is that there are some days when you're not doing so well or there are some days when you don't want to be doing this or you're a bit down or whatever. So 
it's really important that we just acknowledge that because that's actually the healthiest normal thing to happen. It's when people um, tell me that they are totally fine, hasn't had any impact on their life, they're happy, it's, isn't it great, everything's wonderful, that I probably am more concerned. So we need to stop pretending that every day is okay because you will be okay. It's just that it's okay. It's all right to just own it and not be putting that pressure on yourself. Um, the other thing is that we know what to do with anxiety and depression these days so much better than we used to. So being able to actually, you know, if you're finding you are very down and you're down and it's a couple of weeks and you're still feeling down, um, yes, it's an a, adjusting to whatever experience you're going through, but it's also okay to go to your GP and say, can you help me with this? Because we can do things about that. One of the really useful things that, and these are ma many of these things are things I use in my life all the time, is especially when you're living with uncertainty, is that we often just look far too far ahead. So we go, oh my God, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what's going to happen next Christmas? And what's going to happen with the kids? And what... And it's far too much, especially when you don't have any way of actually knowing the answer to that. So especially on those difficult days, we have to pull right back to that step in front of us. And those, the, the amount of steps in front of us that we can, can handle change all the time. So it might be between one... Um, it might be I can manage until I have to go and have another scan... I feel like I can plan those days, I can get on with it, but don't ask me what's happening after that because that's too scary, I can't think that far ahead. But on the really bad days when you're just like, oh, this is far too hard to deal with, you might just be able to do that one step in front of you. And so it's really good to come up with some really s little goals. Like, today I am overwhelmed, I'm going to make myself walk around the block <laughs> and make one phone call or I'm going to treat myself to some chocolate and I'm actually just going to sit down and watch some bad thing on television or whatever it is. This week, I'm going to go through the week, but I'm going to make myself ring one friend. So there are some times when you just have to bring everything back to now. And then it goes, you know, it's more, and we start going, you know what, I think I can plan a weekend away in a month's time. I actually think I can think that far ahead and not get overwhelmed. But on other days, I have to bring it right back down. So decide what time frame you can cope with right at the moment. All of you will be in a different place right now and cope with that. Um, I've absolutely said to uh, people on the phone, Ken, do you think you can make it till lunchtime today? And they'll go, well, yeah, I don't like all this, but yeah, I can make it till lunchtime. OK, let's focus on that. Um, and then you get over that hurdle and then you start getting on with things again. The next thing is learning how to challenge your thoughts and not believe everything you think. We used to think that we should believe everything we think, but gee, we can, our minds can do very big tricks on us, especially when we're living with um, uncertainty. So what I'm talking about here, and I'm going to do it in like two minutes and people do you know, courses on this, um, but what I want to talk about here is what's called cognitive behavioural therapy. It's about learning to um, challenge the negative thoughts that we often jump to because you'll see that there's a chain reaction. So I'm going to give you an example. So a situation happens and because of that situation, for all of us, a chain of events happen. I'll give you an example. So first one is you hear that, uh, that your friends that you usually hang out with all went out without you. I like using this experience because we think that when we grew up, we don't get hurt by this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it still hurts. And we're thinking, oh, well, why would they all go out without me? Okay. So what happens is we have a thought and it's an automatic thought. It just pops up. So this person thinks they don't really like me. I don't mean anything to them. Okay. That's an extreme negative thought. What comes after that is you then feel emotions about that. So you start to feel upset. And then you usually have a physical reaction. So this person's now getting tight shoulders, getting a bit of a headache. They know that, like it's changed their day. 
and they might withdraw and go, I'm not going to contact any of them because clearly I'm not important to them. Of course, there could have been a whole lot of reasons why they went out without them, but this is what happens to us regularly. We do this weird thinking and then it throws us into this other experience. So the automatic negative thought here is the reason why that happened is because I'm not important to them. And so what needs to happen is when we find ourselves, so the day was going fine, suddenly I'm feeling terrible, I don't want to even pick up the phone, I need to go, okay, wait, what happened back then? That person, you know, I heard they went out without me, I assumed it was because they didn't like me. I, sh I actually need to check whether that's true or not. I could go down the rabbit hole or I could ring them and go, how come you didn't invite me? Or whatever I do. I need to work out a way to, to change how I do that. I'll give you another example. You notice your shoulders hurting when you hang out some washing. The automatic negative thought, and again, we might not be really aware that we've thought it, but it's, oh no, it's to do with the cancer. We start to get panicked. We start to feel bad. Um, this person might just go to bed and withdraw and not want to talk to anyone. Um, and they might avoid going to the doctor because this is far too scary and my shoulder's sore and I don't want to face any of this. If we go back and we challenge that thought, so the person might go, okay, wait a minute, okay, my shoulder hurt, is there any other reason why my shoulder could have hurt? Could be that I did some gardening on the weekend, I don't really know, but I need to double check. Do I need to fall apart because my shoulder hurt? It? Um, I'm going to calm myself down because I've learnt about some breathing exercises, so I just need to chill out and, and go back and check this. And then I need to do something about it. So what I might do is take some Panadol, get a heat pack and promise myself I'm going to give this two days because if I've just strained something, it's going to settle and if it hasn't, I'm going to make sure I go and see the doctor. So now I'm not going to carry this suddenly I'm all tense and worried. I'm actually going to deal with it and I'm challenging the fact that this definitely means that I've got cancer in my shoulder. So we get into the habit of constantly checking with ourselves. Suddenly I'm feeling really tense. When did I start feeling that? What did I think? Was it actually true? And try and keep getting on to it. It's very helpful. Oh, here we go. One more. You're due for another scan. This time, you haven't actually clicked what the, fit, what the thought was, but you're just feeling really tense and you're just snapping at everyone in the house. The impact is that there's tension in the relationships around you. Everyone's going, oh, God, you know, can you just... I didn't do anything. Why are you just growling at me? And you're like, I don't know. I just, I'm feeling upset today. Still haven't clicked that it happened when you went, oh, that's right, scan's tomorrow. So, of course, the scan is actually the thought that triggered all of that. Um, I don't want to go and have a scan tomorrow. I hate this every time. Then I have to wait. Then, you know, I don't want that experience. <laughs> So, stop and think about this. Why are you feeling like that? It's because the scan's tomorrow. Totally understandable. Can't change the fact that the scan's tomorrow and um, I need to just accept that it's okay for me to be snappy the day before my scans. So what I might do is remind myself of that. This is a scheduled part of my care. Of course, I'm going to be anxious. And I might tell everyone around me, just want you to know my scan is tomorrow. The day before my scan, I'm going to be snappy. I don't want you to ask anything of me, whatever. Suddenly I've now dealt with, I'm not trying to pretend that some of that's not okay. Okay, so that's another example. Step number four, let go of the things that you can't control. I'm a good one with trying to control things. So I might go, you know, I've got an event tomorrow. I'm really hoping it doesn't rain. As the day goes on, I'm like, oh, God, it looks like it's going to rain. Oh, my God, look at that cloud. What are we going to do if it rains? It's terrible. It could rain. Yep, it could rain. That is not something that you have any control over. You have to go, you know what, it might rain tomorrow. I can control other things. I might go, I need another venue, possibly. Then I know, don't have to worry about it. But, gee, we're good at trying to control things that we can't control. Living up to other people's expectations. Being happy when we're actually not feeling happy. Um, 
needing to be perfect, um, comparing ourselves, going to the cancer support group and going, God, everyone else seems to be coping so much better than me. Yeah, probably not. Maybe everyone's coping the same. But we've got to stop doing those things that we actually have no control over. The fifth thing is... Well, let me go back. Um, is to review how much meaning you have in your life. This was my PhD, so that's why it feels like it's just popped up and you're like, what? What are you talking about? But we did a study where we asked people, in fact, with advanced cancer, to tell us about what their life was like, just storytelling. And then we went back and we kind of looked at how this all fitted into some domains. And what people told us was that they moved in and out of suffering, meaning and coping. So if I give you an example, we have someone who wakes up in the morning and they've got some bone pain. And they, so they wake up, they're aware of the pain and they go, I can't face another day of this. I feel sore and I want to get up. It's terrible. They're in suffering. Their partner comes in and says, come on, let's get up, take your pain medication, go and have a warm shower, get moving. That's coping. And then a friend rings and says, why don't we go for a walk in the sun? And you go for a walk and you go, gosh, I'm lucky. I love this person. It's so nice to have a walk around with, you know, in the wintertime when the leaves are off the trees. That person has moved in and out of suffering, coping and meaning. And we do it all the time. So often we've kind of... I think we've talked about, you know, the roller coaster of cancer or, you know, there's different, the journey of cancer. But one of the most common things in cancer or no cancer is that we move in and out of suffering, coping and meaning all the time. And one of the things that happens when we're facing a really challenging time is we forget to make sure we've got more of that meaning in there. And by meaning, I'm not talking about your big life's purpose or navel gazing. I'm talking about really simple, meaningful things that get us through the day. They're often the things we forget. So when I was living in Melbourne, I was kind of in a city, Melbourne. I grew up on the coast in Tasmania. Whenever something bad happened, my husband would drive me to the beach. Um, so, and it is that powerful. I know when I'm at the beach, I feel totally different. <coughs> it might be that you are. Uh, surround yourself with a child that you love being around or that you get a good book. <coughs> Excuse me. Because what we found was when we looked at what held people together during that up and down and around the place, it was that they had connection with other people, that they had their symptoms managed and that they had meaning in life. They actually structured it into their time. So let me give you some examples. It's the pursuit of little meanings. It's a fascination with nature. This is Tassie, beautiful. It's easy to go and find beautiful parts of nature and absolutely around here as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Doing what you love, which might be um, stage diving like this guy or it might be just that feeling. You know, I, someone was telling me about horse riding she went, you know, I feel like that when I, horse, when I go for a ride on a horse. I haven't done that for so long. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so if you think about some of those, some things that actually give you real joy, when was the last time you did that? And I'm saying that because if you don't structure that in, you won't get that balance back. And, jeez, if there was ever a reminder that we should be doing joyful things... So making sure you go, do you know what? In the next week, I'm going to make sure I do A, B or C because I need to get that balance back. Kindness, giving out to other people, just the simple beauty in the world. Connection, connection, connection. We, met, we could measure this. People that had connection with other people. It doesn't have to be deep, deep friendships. It doesn't need to be 20 friendships. It's just that I see other people regularly and I'm connected in, in my community, really helps people get through. So what I'd love for you to do today is to ask yourself, what do you need right now? Because it changes all the time. So if 
I had been working with you as a social worker and we might have assessed the things you needed when you were first diagnosed and when treatment finished. Um, it's a whole new question again the next time I see you. What do you need right now to enhance things for yourself? Is it um, that you're getting the best medical care, you feel like you've got all the answers or not? Is it that you need to have more you know, support and compassion around you? How are you going to do that? Um, or whatever it is. And it's really good to reassess that as you go. And my final point is um, that you need to allow yourselves to not be brave all the time. Courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. That is all that is required of you. So sometimes it's about taking that pressure off. <laughs>